Welcome to uh, the second in a series of Maternity Voices webinars being hosted by National Maternity Voices and NHS England and NHS Improvement. My name is Hannah Lyons and I'm Acting Chair of National Maternity Voices. I'll be chairing the webinar today. Uh, we've chosen participatory appraisal as a subject for our second webinar. Uh, we chose the subject of these webinars by um, consulting on our Facebook groups of service user and staff members of MVP. And this subject was a very popular choice um, in the poll that we did. Um, so we're absolutely delighted that we have some fantastic contributors to the webinar today who are going to share their experiences with us of using participatory appraisal to reach out um, to all parts of their local community. So I'm going to start by introducing the um, contributors to the webinar today. Um, our speakers are Emily Ahmed, who is the Engagement Project Manager for North East London Commissioning Support Unit. Um, and Emily has brought with her two uh, service users who Emily recruited as peer researchers on a um, participatory appraisal project that she worked on. So we have Igil Kenar and Abuk Deng with us who are going to share their experiences of working as peer researchers on that project. Um, we're very grateful that we've got um, Lisa Ramsey and support of NHS England who have um, who are providing the technical um, side of the webinar today. So thank you very much, Lisa. Um, and also Liz Dew, who is the chair of Sheffield MVP, is going to be monitoring the chat box today. So while the presentation is going on, feel free to use the chat box and to write in there if you would like to ask a question. Um, if you want to put your question in there, and Liz is happy to ask the question for you, or if you prefer to ask your own question um, and to be unmuted to do that, then um, just say that you've got a question you'd like to ask. And then once the presentation is finished, then we'll have an opportunity to have a good conversation um, and to share all of our ideas about how this uh, might be relevant to our work in our local maternity voices partnership. Um, okay, so I think that is everything for now. So I will hand over to Emily. Um, I'm going to be moving the slides forward. So Emily, you can let me know when you want to move the slide on. Um, and yeah. Yes, Emily. All right, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, you have to bear with us on the chat. <laughs> Hopefully it's all go okay. We had a few problems this morning getting started. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about participatory appraisal. We'll introduce ourselves and, um, and our background um, to start with, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're going to go through. And then we should have some time for questions and things at the end. Um, so next slide, please, Anna. So uh, hi, my name is Abdeng, the chair of the UCL HMVP, peer researcher. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a recent service user and also a peer researcher on the BAME Maternity Voices Project. And um, as I mentioned before, my name is Emily Ahmed. I'm an engagement project manager at NEL CSU, which is a commissioning support unit, which actually helps and supports um, CCGs and hospital trusts. Um, and my role is around doing patient involvement and engagement. Um, I'm leading the project, the BME Maternity Voices project, which we'll tell you a bit more about. And I'm also a recent service user and involved on my local MVP. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So um, what we thought would be helpful, um, and we're hoping this will be good for everyone today, is what we wanted to do was talk to you about what participatory appraisal is. So it basically is research done with and by the community. And we'll talk to you a little bit about what the BME Maternity Voices project is and how it started. A little bit of an introduction to what participatory appraisal is. I um, might refer to it as PA, just to make it a bit easier, so if that's all right. And we'll show you some of the tools we've used. Um, and then just to give you an example about how this can work and how it worked for us, we'll talk to you about the best uh, participatory appraisal PA project, um, how we recruited for it, what training people had, and a little bit about the research they did. I was going to talk to you how we were reaching out to BME communities and some of the stories we heard and why this was a really effective way of being able to do that. Abut is going to talk to you a little bit about what we learned and how she thinks this can support the MVP. So, as we said, Abut, is, she was involved in um, the participatory appraisal training and project work, but she's also now recently become the chair of UCLH. So, it's, um, so it's a nice way of thinking about how, how that can go forward. Um, we can talk to you a little bit, if, you, um, if you'd like, about the kind of outcomes and impact of the work, and we'll have time for questions. So, essentially, um, as you can see on the slide here, and, and, and big 
big red letters, a participatory appraisal essentially is it's research, quantitative research. So that means it's all about exploration rather than numbers, which is that kind of quantitative side. So participatory appraisal, essentially the main thing about it is that it really values people, uh, experts in their own lives. Um, and actively engages communities to identify and to explore the issues that affect them. And it supports those communities and those people to analyze that data together and to find solutions together. So it's really about doing research with people rather than on someone or to someone. It's really about trying to get communities to do research on, the, on, their, on their own topic or with the people that are involved in their own communities. So it fits in really well with the ethos of MPPs, because essentially that's the same sort of idea. It's all about co-production, but this is about research and co-production. Um, next slide, please, Helen. So just as a little bit of background, um, so we'll talk to you about the process of PA, but also um, wanted to discuss it. So what we're, how we're using it at the moment. So we're doing um, a BME Maternity Voices project, which we'll talk to you more about. And that is a co-produced participatory appraisal research project. Quite a mouthful. Um, and the idea of it is essentially we're doing a PA research project into black and minority ethnic women's experiences of maternity care based up in North Central London. Um, the idea is to explore how we can best hear people's voices and how we can think about what sort of impact that this approach can have on everyone involved. So this is a co-produced project. So it's involving lots of different people. Um, it's Nell CSU, which is who I work with. It's the peer researchers from our Better Birth Peer Researchers team that we trained into the project with last year, which we'll tell you more about. It's involved UCLH maternity team and staff, uh, the new UCLH MVP, and also the Manor Gardens Welfare Trust, which is a charity based in Camden um, that do loads of support um, during antenatal, kind of preg that whole pregnancy, postnatal, and early years support. And they work primarily with um, with people that maybe have more complex needs and or families um, from black and minority ethnic communities, a lot of people that don't have English as a first language. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> All right, sorry, just making sure we're plugged in back on your wires. I don't have a play with that. Okay, so um, a little bit about the BME Maternity Voices Project. So um, basically the, the whole aim of the project was to kind of continue to raise and include the voices of seldom heard and BME women in maternity. So the idea is it's not about just, it's not, you know, it's about continuing to do this. So it's about doing what we can do, but also working with others to, um, to hear what they're hearing. Um, um, we wanted to make sure that it would inform wider thinking about how these voices are heard and responded to, and we want to build on the research that we did, which we'll talk to you about now, um, last year with the Better Birth Project. Um, and when we did that research, we had from lots of women um, from more BME communities, and we were realizing that a lot of these stories weren't being heard and weren't being shared and weren't being listened to even when, when we did hear them. So what we wanted to do was kind of to do more around that work that we'd already started. Um, we wanted to explore what's the best way for peer-led research to have an impact on firms' development. So we had a lot of learning when we did the first participatory appraisal project, and there were a lot of challenges within that as well. So we kind of wanted to move that forward and to think about how we can really make sure that when we go out and hear people's voices, how that really can have an impact on service development, and it isn't just a tick box, yes, we've heard you, thanks, move along, um, which can be incredibly frustrating, but also really detrimental. When you're asking someone's experiences and you're asking their opinions, and then it doesn't go anywhere, then that's almost more detrimental than not asking them in the first place sometimes. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could enable senior leaders and frontline health professionals to hear and to involve cells in her communities and co-production so we wanted to make sure that there's that real diversity in, in who's being involved in, in co-producing services. Um, and really importantly, we need to share the learning and that's gonna to contribute to the development of the UCL Center for Co-Production, which I would advise anyone to Google. Um, so they are trying to do lots of things around bringing together the learning for co-production and we got our funding for, them, for this project. Um, so I don't know, but I'm sure they probably will have some more funding in the future. So I would advise that as a good spot to um, have a look for something. Right, next slide, please. So just really quickly, where this project started, so as I'm sure pretty much every single person on this webinar is going to know, um, we had the Best Birth National Maternity Transformation. In North Central London, we were an early adopter for that. And, um, and what we decided to do within that, I was involved in um, basically being brought in to look at the 
the participation, patient public participation, I think, was what I was asked to do. And so one of the things that we decided to do was go, right, okay, well, it isn't about me or one person going out and asking people what they think. We need a much bigger team than that. We need a much more diverse team than that. We need to be able to reach all these communities. And there's only so many people I can speak to. And it's only so, it's, even if I speak to everyone, there's a real limit in even what they're going to tell me. So we needed to break through that, which is why we decided to use participatory appraisal. Um, we will talk to you a little bit about how that, what we heard through that project, but through that project, um, we learned lots. It was really successful, but as with everything, there was burning and frustration. And those frustrations were actually brilliant in a way because that's what stimulated us to get some funding and to do the next project, which is what we're working on at the moment. So uh, next, next slide, please, Hannah. So a brief introduction to the participatory appraisal. So as I said, it's a community-based approach to qualitative research. It is community-led and it is peer-led. That is, the, that is the main thing about it. It isn't about a researcher coming in and doing some work and finding something out. It's about enabling communities to do that for themselves, leading it themselves, asking the questions that they want to ask and speaking to people that they want to reach. Um, it's really flexible in the way that it works and it can meet lots of people's needs. And then one of the ways it does that is by being really visual and using lots of creative tools. There's probably some things that you guys have seen and maybe started using in the MVPs, um, but it's about having a methodology for how we use those tools so that it can be really effective. Um, it, by being really creative and visual and the ways we work, we can overcome barriers such as formal literacy, which is incredibly important. And really importantly, it's qualitative research, which means it's exploratory. So we're not asking people, rate this from zero to 10, okay, thanks, or did you want this or this? We want to explore. We don't want to just say, how did you feel about this? We want to enable people to explore how they felt about it so that they can think about it and then they can tell us. And that's really important because if you just ask someone what they think, we're only going to get a really small response. You need to support them to think about what it is. What, what did they experience? How did other people experience it? How does that impact on them? So their experiences, what happened? Why do they think that happened? How it's affected them? And really importantly, the most basic thing um, about all of this is that because it's community and peer-led, so basically what we're aware of is that people communicate much more honestly and openly with people that they trust. So it's great if, um, say, looking at maternity services, if a head of midwifery goes and does a walk around the patch and speaks to service users, that's brilliant. But there's only so much that those people can tell her. It's great if I myself, as an engagement manager, goes around and speaks to someone, but there's only so much they're going to tell me. We know we are always more honest with people that we trust and people we see as our peers. So everybody here, I'm sure, when you had, you know, whichever, well, I don't know, think about, say, my first experience of, of pregnancy, I did get asked in my opinion. I said a few things. And then I went home and I spoke to my mum and spoke to my friend. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this, 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 and this. Suddenly, everything or this truth or this experience, I was able to explore and communicate it. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to enable. So you can speak to people that you trust, and sometimes that has to be people in your peer and in your communities. Okay, next, next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through some examples. These are things that you've probably seen before, but this is just how we use VA. So, and there's a methodology behind how we kind of use it, but we have lots of different tools. So mapping. So map, not necessarily to say from here to here, but to explore what's important to people. So these maps I did in um, another PA project that we did in uh, East Anglia. So it was looking at across the whole of the east of England about generally about people's experiences of health and well-being. So this wasn't just maternity, it's just general health and well-being. And as you can see on the map on the right-hand side, transport is incredibly important. Those train lines run through everything, but also green spaces. And, ha and so whilst we're not just going to look at that map and go, this is what we think it means, what we do is create these maps, and then we have conversations around those maps. And then we can understand, okay, this is why, this is what's important. And people start going, oh, yeah, then this and these ducks represent this for me. And they explain it. And by recording that, what we're doing is not just saying, what do you think is important, what do you want? We're allowing people to explore it, to explore it visually, to explore it with or without words. Okay, next, next one, please. So timelines, again, this is something we've used a lot. Um, and again, a really effective way of getting people to be able to explore their experiences. So we have that's one of those IKEA rolls of paper there massive long one along, along the wall, and getting people to explore, um, they, I think we probably color-coded this, so maybe pink was like bad experiences, yellow was good experiences, green might have been ideas for what they could do. So it's looking at 
exploring why this happened, oh, and then this happened. And then people, as they do this, start to see the trends and they start to think, actually, you know what, that, that was because of this. Or they put something up and someone goes, oh, yeah, that happened here. And also, the maternity experience doesn't begin and end where we think it is. You know, it's not just about antenatal labor and postnatal. For some people, it was actually it was from when they first found out they were pregnant, or it's from even before then, when someone else they knew got pregnant, or when they thought they might want to get pregnant, or whatever it happens to be. So it's allowing people to explore their timeline of experience of doing it in a group setting. Okay, next one, please. So this is an H form. Anyone at the London Strategic MVP Day um, will have seen we put one of these up um, and think we're kind of using these more and more. So this is an H form. It's really useful if you take anything away from today just you know just give this one slide um it's a really good way of being able to do evaluations but also to get feedback so as you can see we've um said uh, this question was about tell us about your experience of health and well-being it could be anything it could be really general or could be specific you can get you um you can get people to say what they thought was negative experiences we've got the pink on the left and they they're talking as they're writing their post-it notes or they could draw pictures on their post-its they're talking about it and then the positive side, um, or the good experiences. And then once people have a chance to think about the good and the bad, then they can they can bring forward what are their ideas for change. And having it all on one page means everyone can look at each other and really think and learn and, and talk through it. So in a participatory appraisal research session, we would be using something like this, but we normally have three people um, within the team. So we'll have somebody who is facilitating this to happen, so getting people to put their, their questions or their, or their comments up. We've got somebody that is an observer, so they are trying to really listen and hear what stories are being told, so that they're able to stand there with a notebook and, and make sure that you're not losing all those stories and, and what's being told. And then we have something called an anti-saboteur, sounds a bit negative, more like a fixer. Um, that's the person that means they're there to enable that this is happening. So if you imagine this, this big flip chart stuff on the wall, there might be somebody that's getting upset. And then, or somebody that's really angry about something and they're taking over the whole conversation, the anti-saboteur is there, they can help that person to decide, make sure that they feel heard, but also make sure that they're not taking over the whole session. Or it might be, in our case happens quite a lot with maternity, it might be some little hands trying to steal our post-it notes. So maybe the anti-saboteur is there actually giving up some kids to keep them distracted. So that, that's an example of how it works. Okay, next one, please. Um, these are uh, dot voting or beanie counters. So, say for example, with that last one, you look at all the ideas people had, and then we'll put it up on a uh, sheet, so the one on the left hand side, and people can vote which they think was most important. So, this isn't quantitative, it's not like, oh, 90% of people thought this, because you're not speaking to that big a sample of people, it's qualitative. So, what, what you can do is get an indication of this was really important to the people that we spoke to. And you find out things didn't realize. So, for example, on this one, um, this, again, was how well-being services, the thing that was most important was people wanted, they said, constant constructive feedback loop. What? There's no way that the health service uh, providers would have thought that was what was most important to people. But when we asked people in the East of England on this one session, that was what was most important to them. So it allowed them to go, right, these, this is our experience, these are our ideas, and these are the ideas that are most important to us right now. Okay, next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of a history of what we did, so using all these tools, we thought, right, we need to train a team of peer researchers um, in North Central London. So to do that, um, what we did, we, we first of all we made sure we co-designed everything from the start. So we co-designed the recruitment process and the expression of interest form, which you can see on the right-hand side. So we knew that people would have barriers to, 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 to being involved. So we made sure that we planned out what some of those barriers might be. So for a basic example, people told us, we need to be able to create a form that someone can fill in with one hand while bouncing a baby on their hip. That's got to be done. They can't be standing there for ages. They don't want to take it away and forget about it. Or they want to be able to do it on their phone when, they get, when they're sitting breastfeeding later. Or they want to do it on their phone while they're sitting on the bus or whatever it happens to be. So we need to understand what people's barriers might be to even applying to be, to be one of our peer researchers. So we spoke to people and we planned a whole recruitment process around how to break down those barriers. And that was why we ended up, which we'll talk to you about, a really successfully diverse group of people. And really importantly, we were able, because this was the best diverse early adopter, we had some of the funding, and we were able to remunerate based on the PPD rate, which is like, no way. And sometimes that's a real challenge, and it often is a real challenge, but it's so important to remunerate people, especially for when they're doing this sort of work, because you want people to feel valued, but also because you're asking people to do quite a lot. 
Um, when we recruited our team of researchers, we advertised it everywhere. It went out to social media, it went out to every network that we had, every meeting that I went to, we went to baby groups we'd heard of, we went to DCSE organisations that might be working with groups that we didn't normally reach. So, for example, the Manor Gardens Welfare Trust, we went to them, we went to absolutely everybody, and we asked them to send it to everybody. So it just went out far and wide. Um, we got over 50 applications, and we did interview 30 people, and we recruited 15 people. And um, Hannah, next slide, please. So the diversity of our team was why it was so successful, and the co-designing and recruitment process was why it was so diverse. So we got, um, in North Central London, have got um, five boroughs, and we recruited 15 service users that represented all of those boroughs and all of those maternity units. They were incredibly diverse in their religions, their ethnicities, their skills levels, their education levels, the number of children people had, and in their life experiences. Um, they spoke 16 languages fluently, as you can see underneath here, and that was really effective in meaning we could reach different communities. It didn't mean that all of those participatory appraisal sessions had to happen in that language, but sometimes that was how we would access a group. Or sometimes it meant that there might be people within that group that we could reach and that they didn't feel left out. In fact, they might have actually been able to communicate in a way they'd never been able to before. Um, but we were really aware, as you can see on the picture, there's some people missing. There were no dads. There were no dads. We really tried to reach out to dads. We didn't get any. Um, we didn't have any LGBTQ uh, parents. And we didn't have any parents um, with, uh, with physical disabilities. So it was really important um, we're aware of that, and as we would grow, and if we were able to get funding to grow the team, we would definitely want to reach out further. Okay, next slide, please. So, just to give you an idea of what training that they had, so there was, um, this is, I think it was like over about a year um, long of the program or project. So, they did three days training initially, and four days, the whole team together, understanding the ethos behind participatory appraisal, um, behaviors and attitudes, what the different roles are how you put your own views aside and you enable others to share. So a key way of doing that is enabling people to say what they heard, be heard, and then be able to put that aside and go, it's not that's not important, but actually sometimes when you're so focused on what you've experienced, it blinds you to being able to hear and see what other people have experienced. Um, we taught people how to practice and how to select the different PA tools and when you would do that. And we taught people how to think about designing field work Everyone in that group decided where we went and did the research. That they decided what locations we went to and which groups we needed to speak to. Um, they all went out and delivered a few fieldwork sessions, and then we had some feedback. We could refresh, we met in cafes and talked about what the process was. And then we did an analysis day where people would talk to pull out the main thematic analysis, which would feed into a final report. Um, and we had a stakeholder day, um, and that was then the report and the findings were presented to key stakeholders. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, within that first bit of the project, so this isn't the CME Voices project, this is the one that kind of led to that. We spoke to 179 people across North Central London. We did 30 research sessions. Really importantly, those sessions happened in the community where people are at, not asking people to come to us. Um, we spoke to 169 women and 10 men. As you can see, a massive range of nationalities we spoke to. The majority of people that we spoke to were from CME groups, and there were slightly less, actually, um, from, a, from the white British group, which was really good, because quite often um, they can be, when you speak to people in research, they, um, they, they don't get a very diverse um, community to speak to, and I think that was one of the real strengths of our project. Okay, next slide, Hannah. So, um, now I'm going to pass over to Igor, who's going to talk to you a little bit about um, about why that was so important for the BME community that we spoke to um, and, and, and our experience of it. Um, hi there. So, I'm going to just talk um, a little bit about um, the things that we heard from the BME only sessions. Um, obviously, there was a lot that came out from those groups, but um, we don't have time to go through everything. Um, I am a BAME service user myself, um, and we were trained up, as Emily explained, to do the peer, peer research. And I think that had a big impact on how much the participants, the service users, were able to open up to us. And also, um, as Emily mentioned, the PA tools um, worked really well for these particular groups who were illiterate um, and who had language barriers. So, um, a lot of the participants, a lot of the moms that we spoke to in these um, BAME only groups were saying that actually it was the first time that anyone had ever asked about their experiences or views um, in terms of um, their experiences within the maternity services. 
and um, that they've never taken part in sensitive research before. Um, mums shared that um, different prejudices, discrimination, or unconscious bias impacted directly on care, the care that was offered. Um, for example, um, some of the Somali mums were saying that um, they were having, they were getting comments um, or being told off for having, for example, too many children. Um, some of these Somali moms didn't actually only had a couple of children, for example, and she was told to use contraception and not have any more. Um, so uh, that you know that that definitely came across. Again, um, there were African service users who were who shared that actually there were comments being made about um, Africans having um, higher assumptions that Africans have higher pain thresholds, so they weren't given, med you know, um, painkillers. Um, they, you know, they assumed that they could deal with the pain. So, um, you know, really difficult, difficult um, uh, conversations about how judgmental care really creates those additional barriers. Um, also, I think um, one of the things that really stayed with me was that um, the some of the users in one group, they shared that they actually had to exaggerate symptoms or even lie to, in order to be offered the scan, to offer a blood test or just for reassurance. And um, I think, you know, on different levels, on one level, it shows how successful, I guess, this kind of research is in terms of how comfortable they were to say something so honest. Um, but also, I guess, it indicated of how deeply rooted mistrust is, and I assume that obviously this this, this um, situation of exaggerating symptoms or lying about your symptoms, I'm sure, happens not only in BAME groups, but uh, probably in non-BAME groups, particularly for vulnerable and seldom heard other other people. Um, and also the just to think about the health implications, this kind of this kind of information. Um, again, um, particularly with the BAME groups that uh, we listened to, there was an overwhelming majority that did not, didn't know about postnatal care at all. So, um, you know, they were saying that back home, after birth, that's it, there's no postnatal care. And they generally, when we asked them what the experience of postnatal care was, they um, responded, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I think, that, you know, that in itself, um, that shows that that's definitely an area that um, the aim of people felt that they were finding it very difficult to access. But there was also um, uh, one of the other things that came across quite powerfully was that assumptions were made about accessibility, what accessibility means for these particular groups. So um, although you know it was obviously all with good intentions, sometimes, for example, um, providing leaflets with translated material was assumed with um, improved accessibility, but in fact, this wasn't the case for the majority of the women that we spoke to who were also illiterate. So having a, a leaflet in their own language was actually not very useful for them. Um, and um, they definitely didn't prefer it to be as a substitute um, for face-to-face -face interaction and support. But um, also, um, I think equally valuable is that we did hear a lot of very, very positive stories too. And I think that's as valuable as sort of some of the other things that we've heard. Uh, that was that there were um, service users who shared that interpreters were provided from the very start to the end, which was incredibly important in terms of their experience of maternity services. Um, there was um, health professionals that didn't make those assumptions, that provided holistic support, that linked in really critical key um, specialist services, like referring them to FGM clinics. And that really, really changed things, not just for those particular service users, but also for other women and young girls. Actually, um, I remember one of the mums said, you know, I went and told everybody about these FGM clinics. So we had a really positive impact on other people as well who hadn't used the services yet. Um, and finally, you know, there was, um, there was just an overwhelming sympathy for all the midwives. Um, you know, they weren't blaming the midwives at all. And um, they were so grateful for the support and positive experience. And, you know, they were saying that actually um, a smile from a midwife, you know, that friendliness that they saw was, was so, was actually enough to transcend so many barriers. Um, and I, I think that's really, really important. And that was something that they, you know, um, shared with us. Um, just, just finally, like one mum that shared that, uh, who had um, shared that she was actually breaking down and was a midwife 
told her to uh, took her baby for a few minutes and told her to go out and you know get some air. She was really crying when she was saying this, and she was just saying, you know, that meant everything for those few minutes. Um, that they were all, you know, they they you know, they made some really really positive um, and and an emotional shout out to all the midwives out there. So yeah, that that's just a bit of sort of things that we must be heard. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to a book a book now. Yep. So next slide. Okay, so um, I wanted to ask Luke a little bit about how, how it feels to be involved in this project um, and how she thinks that this can support being achieved. So whatever you'd like to tell us, um, maybe you can start with making some memorable stories about something that you've heard or... Uh, I think it was a great opportunity to be part of this EPA research. Um, I had a lot of opportunity to meet uh, with many women. They took their time to, to, to tell us about their experience and reflected to the, the care that they received from the hospitals. Um, also, there is actually one um, sad uh, story that we received from one of the women that she was pregnant with twins. Uh, and then they told her that uh, one of your twins is dead. And she was a bit shocked that um, she's already losing one of the twins. And then she was stressed, and then I think they wanted to give her some medicine. Um, and then it's a wrong medicine as well. And then uh, one of the doctors came and then did another scan. And then they said, no, oh, sorry, yeah, your case is a lie. And then uh, they, they were sitting in a different position. That's why they couldn't find her, um, their baby heartbeat. And then, and from there, she was happy, and then, yeah, that's all. That's the memory and food, uh, story that I can tell about it now. And what about what kind of skills do you think that you've learned through doing the budget patriot appraisal training? What have you learned, and, and, and or what developed, and, and how do you think you could use that within your work at um, UCLA GMPP? I think I developed my listening skill and data collections. Like uh, for the launch, we used the hedge form, as you can see. We used the hedge form and said how, what was what wasn't, and some suggestions. So we received a lot of feedback from that hedge form. And then we, this is the way actually if the, all the MVP can use to collect all the data. So that will help. We can reach a lot of people from there. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, Hannah, could you go to the last slide, please? So just um, just to kind of summarize what sort of impact and what kind of outcomes we had from this project and this work. Um, after the initial um, uh, project we did um, in 2018, um, some of the members of the team, the CA team, went up to Manchester and presented their work at the NHS Expo, which was brilliant because it meant that we would teach talk to people on a kind of a national stage about how important it is to reach people and how important it is to reach diverse groups and telling people this is one of the ways that you can do that. Um, we have used the learning to develop some maternity services, obviously, in North Central London. It's fed into that in lots of different ways and probably ways that we don't even know about. And that's one of the tricky things is how do we know about all the impact and the outcomes? Like some things we do know, but loads we don't. That's something we need to get better at. Um, one of the brilliant things um, is that because of all of our work and, and after that year and some of the work that we kind of did around that, funding was allocated for all the North Central London MPPs. And previously, there wasn't any really. Fun, oh, I think there was maybe one thousand pounds for all of for all four of them. Um, and now, um, so all of them have received funding or are receiving funding. And, um, and Abu is now the chair at UCLH MVP, which is fantastic. All of our teams still are very really active, and they use these PA skills in their communities. So they've told us about when they've used it to um, look at breastfeeding support. Uh, somebody's used it looking at school lunches, and then. Um, and, and so it's really it's really impacted on not just one, one way of doing something, but they've been, been able to use it in lots of different areas. Um, and really importantly, and I think what's really good is when you can do a really strong piece of research work, we can do a strong bit of voices work, and you can voice that well, that leads to further funding. And funding is always a challenge for us. So this work then ended up in um, in this in, it was the North Show Healthy New Town project. They did the same thing. They got some funding to train PA. Um, so I went in and uh, we trained a whole load of people across East Anglia, and they did a piece of work, and it also resulted in us getting the funding for the Maternity Voice Project. 
And I suppose one of the bits of um, my kind of key points about all of this, I think one of the reasons that play works really well and is A, because it reaches diverse communities and A, and, and because the community are doing it for themselves, but also because it is a research methodology. We're following a specific approach. And when you're trying to communicate to health professionals, um, leaders, and, um, and people that essentially have their whole basis of their work and their training has been looking at evidence base, evidence base, what's the evidence base for this? Well, we need to have a good evidence base and we need to have a strong methodology to say, this is how we found this out. This is who we spoke to. And these are the stories. Because if we just say, we spoke to these people and they said this, then it just so often and so frustratingly, you can just see sometimes that get backed away. Oh, that's that one person banging on about this or that's just one person's story. And we'll know. This, is, this, is, this has been done, we've used, actually we've used a community methodology, the ethos is right there, but what we've done is we've been able to bring these stories together, and the more that we do that, the stronger that we can be, and, and the louder that all of our voices can be. So the Director of the Health and Wellbeing in North Central London said that they felt that this, this project really was a, a move from them being in a listening to a co-production phase, which was just exactly what we wanted, and the peer researchers um, when we looked at the outcomes and impact of them, one of them said, and I think this is so important, one of the most important things was that people that we spoke to felt heard for the first time, and it was really helpful for them to feel that their experiences weren't for nothing. And I think that's, you know, I'm going to leave it there because I think that's, that's one of the most important points. So now we'll open it up to Hannah. I think she's going to take the question. And, and the final Presentation well. mode is now disabled. <laughs> Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, yep. If you want to put, uh, if you want to put the final slides on, Hannah, then that's got um loads of our Twitter details and contacts as well. So if people want to ask us questions now, but even just in the future or follow the project, that they can just follow any one of those those Twitter handles. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emily, um, and Igul and Abuk. That was just really, really fascinating um, presentation. And I think many of the people on the call will have learned a huge amount from that. And I think a lot of us will recognize so much of the values of what you've done and some of the, the way of doing things, I think will be quite familiar to people working in MVPs, that creative way of seeking feedback and being exploratory and really giving people space and time to give their feedback um, and and reaching out to different parts of the community. But I think it's just really interesting to hear about how you've been able to do that um, using this methodology and um, it'd be very interesting, I think, for us to have a conversation about whether that's something that would benefit MVPs to, to be doing something using a kind of recognised methodology like, like you've done um, and kind of takes it onto a different... Um, scale, up to a different scale perhaps. Um, so, yeah, it would be great um, if anyone on the line would like to ask any questions of Emily or Igel or um, Abbott. I don't know, do we have any questions in the chat box, Liz? Yes, Don has just asked a question. Um, do you, Donna, do you want to ask it or shall I read it out? I'll, I'll happily read it out. So the question is, would you suggest involving midwives and the HDPs and the peer research or completely or keep completely oh. peer service user? Sorry, so I, would we? Uh, should everybody just mute themselves? Too? So if, you, um, if you're on your phone, if you press star six, if you're not talking, and if you're on the web, if you kind of move your mouse, you'll be able to see a little set of buttons on the left-hand side. You can press the one with the microphone so that you mute yourself. Yeah, we just need everyone to mute themselves if they're not speaking for the rest of the webinar. Well, may, maybe just mute everybody, Lisa, and I'll read the questions out. And then, and then people answering can unmute themselves. Makes sense. Hello, hang on. Okay, it's got a bit better. There was a grand noise, it's got to be better. Okay, great. Okay. What was that question, members? So the question was, would you suggest involving um, HCPs in the peer research event or keep it completely peer service user focused? Um, so we can explain a little bit what we're doing at the moment. So one of the reasons that the, it's really effective, that, that peer on peer, the women and, and, and parents and families speaking to other parents and families is really effective. 
So if we were to do that same work with midwives, yes, we could find out stuff. And I'll explain we are doing a little bit with midwives. But actually, if we really want to do it in the same ethos of, of care, then we should be training midwives to be able to ask other midwives. Because, well, again, or you have the same challenge. While they will tell us something, I'm sure there'll be, there's always people who think they're going to hold back a little bit. So it can be used, but to be really, to be really effective, actually what would be amazing is we could have midwives trained to be able to do that too. But, um, so on our BME Voices project, we're doing, so on next week, Monday, we've got a research session in the community. We're doing two or three in the community um, with families. We're then going to do a session with, um, with some of the, they're not so much for healthcare professionals, but the people that are supporting their advocates, so the, the mentors that they have and the support that they have from, from the charity that we're going to be working with. So we're going to ask them about what stories they've heard and how we can support them to tell those stories, because they hold a lot of those stories. And then we're going to do two sessions with healthcare professionals, midwives, obstetricians, and we're going to ask them about, not about their experiences, but we're going to show them some of the stories we've heard. And what we're going to do is ask them, how can we best enable them to hear these sorts of stories? So we are involving them, but we're not involving them to ask about their experiences of, of, of working with healthcare professionals. We're asking about how we can best enable them to hear the stories of, of um, services. I think when I was invited in, um, in the hospital to speak to the midwife about my experience, and then they were shocked that they, they don't know about this. So that's good if there is a way that we can do this with the midwife as well. It will be really helpful. And, and also, um, with the with the Better Birth project that we initially did, um, it was quite nice to see that because um, we were we were talking with midwives as well during the whole process, and um, actually um, some of the feedback that we got in terms of continuity of care and other things was used directly in in the training. So that was that was really positive. And there were there were there were uh, mums who shared that they would love to be able to you know have that conversation with midwives and really wanted to find out if, you know, if this would be related to them. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Sarah, can you just um, say who you are and what that project was that you were working on? Um, so I'm Igil. It was part of the, the Better Birth project that we um, did the initial um, PA research. And, and um, so Emily and the book. Yeah. Okay. So that was part of the same project? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. So I have another question here um, from Erin. Did you get funding prior to starting this project to help you get it off the ground? Um, so the, for the first project we did, which was the, the Better Birth um, kind of peer research project where we did all the initial training, um, we had, there was funding in a pot for, um, for doing patient public involvement. And then I, said this is the work that we, I want to do, and then was able to allocate some of that funding to be spent in this way. But it was already kind of allocated. It was already earmarked for like patient public involvement engagement work. Um, but for the BME Voices project, we applied for that together. So the, the peer researchers from that first project, we all got together and decided what we wanted to apply for, and we put in a funding application um, to apply for that to apply for that money. So that, that money that we got from the UCL Centre for Co-Production it wasn't enough, it wouldn't be enough to pay for the training, but it is enough for us to pay the peer researchers we've already trained to do more research. We've still got someone on the line who's not on mute, so it'd be really good if everyone could just put themselves on mute because we have got a bit of background noise. Are you, are you able to mute individuals, Lisa? Not individuals, I can mute everybody, okay. but I've been... <clears throat> Sorry, I just <laughs> So did you pay the people in the community who were doing the research or it was the training that was funded? Um, it was the training that was funded. We funded to, to provide the training and then we and then we paid all of the peer researchers to do um, the PPE rate. So it was £75 for half a day um, or £150 for a full day plus childcare and expenses. Um, what was quite frustrating in the Better Birth Project um, was that we had to, because of the way that it was set up, we had to pay people in vouchers, which I wasn't particularly happy with. But, you know, it was better than nothing. Um, but now with the BME Voices Project, because of the way that it's set up, 
And because, I guess because it's that learning, because it's another project, it's that people are starting to better understand PPP payments, then now we're able to pay people, um, pay people properly in, in money. Yeah. But we didn't, we didn't pay people to, to be involved in the research sessions. We didn't pay the research participants. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like if you would like to come and share your stories, we'll pay you this money. It was, we were paying the researchers to go out and speak to people in, in communities. Yeah, no, that's fine. And that's quite consistent with what we would expect within an MVP as well, I think. Mm -hmm. so, um, sorry, quick question on a similar note. Um, so when you were recruiting people, were line muted? Is the project, have you kind of retained them or was it, who are you recruiting them just to kind of just for this project? <laughs> I should say that we retain the people that we recruited. Um, yes, definitely. So um, from, we're still in touch with all the 16. Well, this, 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 this one, women. one person dropped out during the training. Part. We're still in touch with all the 15 women. We've actually um, kept a WhatsApp group. We all, we're all in touch. Um, some of us have moved on and worked. We're working with the AME voices. Um, so we're definitely um, all talking to each other and helping each other, you know, continue this work. And um, we're quite proud of what what's done and we feel it's something that, that's very close to our hearts and we, you know, um, we're really excited about moving this forward and making sure that the conversation carries on and all of that learning doesn't just sort of, you know, um, disappear really. So, um, I mean, we, we're quite happy that um, the team is together still. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Like what I didn't, what I was really aware that I didn't want to happen is that, oh, there was this bit of NHS funding to do this bit of work and people were trained up and did this one bit of research and then it disappears. Like, the initial bit of research we did was amazing, but what we've got is this amazing resource of these amazing women who've got this training and this experience, and these different from these different communities, and we wanted to keep building on that. So the, the funding, you know, we all put together our ideas to apply for this next bit of funding for the DME Voices project, um, and, and whoever wants to be involved, you know, we sent out, said, okay, we're going to do some sessions on these dates, who wants to be a peer researcher? So it's kind of making sure that everybody's involved, and I think as much as possible, you know, we want that to be able to continue. And I think that's really important that you don't just get people to do one thing and then leave them, but that they have an opportunity to develop. So, you know, and those people have done loads of stuff. So like a business I said is now the MVP chair, or UCLA. Um, Anna is the evaluation lead on our BME Voices project. I was doing everything on our BME Voices project. And, you know, it's everybody working together and moving it forward, and that's what's really important. And that's really amazing to hear that from the perspective of MVPs that you know having a one-off budget like that could actually lead to a lot of ongoing engagement in the local maternity voice partnership. We have a question from um, Vicky. Did you ask the black and minority ethnic communities for suggestions on how to reach them? Um, yes, yeah, we did, and there were there were there were some really good recommendations. Um, obviously, I don't have all of them right now in front of me, but for example, um, some of the mums were saying that. Uh, they were told to go and do pregnancy tests themselves, for example, but they said it was, you know, there's a big cultural barrier to doing this stuff, so they didn't understand how to carry out a pregnancy test. So they were making some really good recommendations saying that instead of going to a GP, they definitely preferred to go to sort of a different community um, setting, like a children's centre or something similar, where um, they could go, for example, to do a blood test or a urine test. And if they had, um, or, you know, speak to someone familiar, um, so whether that was a, you know, a maternity mentor, and they felt that if there, there was that, um, then they wouldn't go to any &E and spend sort of six hours um, for a blood test and so on, because they, they found they really struggled to navigate um, uh, through sort of the referral um, processes and the pathways. So, it, it, um, you know, quite a few of them said that this is what they preferred. But there were definitely some really good recommendations, and hopefully you'll get a chance to sort of gather all of that, um, mm. you know, um, and, and be able to showcase that and share that mm. across. And I think what's important as well to remember is that, like, this team of peer researchers, they are themselves really diverse, and they were the ones that co-designed where that research was going to happen and how we were going to ask and what questions we were going to ask. So from the very beginning, that's how we did it. And then even now with the Baby Voices project, one of the things, you know, we're asking people about their experiences, but we're also asking people how do they want to make sure their voices are heard? And we're speaking to the people that they that they have their support workers and that they're, they're bilingual, bilingual maternity mentors um, about 
how can we enable them to enable the women and families? And how can we enable those advocates to be able to tell those stories? So it, it's very much constantly not just asking people's experiences, but also asking how do they want to be involved and how can we enable that those stories are heard? Can I ask a quick question? Um, I don't know if you have the information, but do you do you have any data on, for example, how many of those women were black British women and like some of the things that they said as well? So we've got um, so we've got how, a, a rough idea of what the demographics were, but we don't have exactly who said what. And this is something that was a bit frustrating. So we within this first project, and this is a general part of the learning. It comes down to data ownership a little bit, I think. So in our first project, we did the research, we did the analysis, or early analysis, but then that data was sent off and somebody else was writing up the report, and that was just the way that had to be agreed because it was how, the, how that initial project worked. And that was quite frustrating because that research went off and a report that was written that didn't really hold everything that we wanted it to say, and it didn't, it didn't really tell all the stories of the women that we spoke to, especially the BME community. And when we wanted that data back, so that we could have at least the raw data so that we could say, okay, these communities are saying this, or these communities are that, and we found we weren't able to get it. Um, and that was a really big learning curve and really frustrating, but there's something I guess that we work, we've worked on and we've now recognized for this project is that that isn't going to be the case. We, we are going to continue to hold and own that data as a team, we're going to write that data up. So yes, we're having support, um, you know, kind of working all together. But we're we're going to write that report and we're going to hold that data. I think that's really important because we've we've lost so much from that first project, and that was really what stimulated that frustration was what stimulated um, us to apply for the funding to do the second project. Okay, thank Laura, you. Laura, did you want to add anything? Because you said something about how the um, feedback actually gets used. Laura has said in the chat. I'm just trying to oh. unmute myself. <laughs> I think I've done it now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm unmuted. But it's not a, a not an easy uh, answer, I'm sure. But it, I just think it would be really worth exploring how we get not not just getting this feedback on the table, but then what's done with it after that. Because in my experience, there always feels a bit of a pushback to qualitative data or qualitative analysis, so by that I mean the actual stories of individual people. Um, often, not always, but often um, CCGs or local return systems are very interested in data and quantitative feedback. And so, and it's brilliant to have this, you know, tried and tested methodology used and, you know, you can take that to your, to the people who are listening to the feedback and say this is why it's really important, but are there any other ways that you found, Emily, that um, sort of top tips, I suppose, of actually getting that qualitative feedback listened to and then acted upon? Yeah. Okay. So I'll say, so I guess there's three main ways I would say. One, first of all, is that I think it isn't a quick and easy win. What we're trying to do here is not, and all of our work in co-production as well as in participatory appraisal, we're trying to get people to hear the voices of patients and the public. And that doesn't come easily. It's a cultural shift. It's a change that we're trying to make across the health system. So I think one of the ways that this project has worked and, um, and one of the impacts that it has is it's about enabling professionals to start understanding how to listen and enabling them to listen. Um, so I think it is don't always, and, it's, and having something, having people to respond to suggestions and ideas is a real challenge. But I think the one part of that is about that wider cultural shift, that wider change of ethos about how and why we should be listening to people. This helps them to do that because, because at least it gives some framework to how we're doing it to help people to be able to trust it. But it's interesting, the idea about evidence base. Like loads of our maternity services, loads of procedures and things that we do aren't actually, haven't actually necessarily got a specific evidence base. Like it's assumed that they do, but they don't always. And some do. So we kind of often in health pick and choose a little bit about which bit we want an evidence base for. It's we don't want to hear about, okay, that's the one, well, we're not sure about that. Yeah, we need an evidence base for that. Um, so, so it's about that cultural shift, really, about understanding how patient public involvement should and could um, the second thing is about um, is about just sharing and sharing as much as possible. And I think really, so you know, even us being involved in the webinar today is really helpful because that's us talking about it, putting it out on social media, making sure that 
keep the hearing and listening. Um, I think there's something in them, you, you have to hear something a certain number of times before you start to really trust it or engage with it. So just, I think that repetitive, just constantly being as loud and talking as much as you can about it. Um, and then I guess a more practical note. Um, so we didn't do this um, in the Better Birth Project. And again, this was another bit of luck learning and a, a space frustration. Our, um, our final stakeholder event with the Better Birth Project was, was not what we envisioned and wanted it to be. It got much reduced. It, it became a presentation and a report giving, which wasn't what we wanted. Um, but when I did this work um, with in, in East England recently, um, and that was just a couple months ago with that work finished, what we did at the end of the project was we had a facilitated stakeholder thing, and that is what really enabled things to be put forward. So, yes, we had some of the peer researchers come up and present and tell the stories. Yes, we had the written report. But then we had a whole day where we basically facilitated activities for key stakeholders, so commissioners, um, it was GPs, health professionals, and people from the community and service users to come together. And then each table took a theme and that they went through a series of activities where they had to say, right, which of these ideas are we going to look at right now, like right today? Which, one, which of these ideas are we going to prioritize what's not being done or what could be done? And then they chose one of them, and then they went through a series of activities that we facilitated using PA tools to be able to go, right, this is the one we're going to prioritize. This is, this is how we're going to brainstorm what we need to do next. This is, and, then, and then creating and planning the first steps to making that happen. And then saying to people, right, you need you have to take away one action. Everyone, big, how big or small, could be, I'm going to actually get this to happen. I'm going to get funding, or it could be, I'm just going to email and get this other person involved. But everybody had to take some ownership and some action to take forward. And I guarantee that not all of those actions will be taken forward. But even if 40% were, even if 30% were, then it would be 30 40% more than, than ever had been before. So I think it's, it's culture change. It is sharing and shouting, and it is holding really well facilitated plans, stakeholder events that hold people to account. I hope that's helpful. And I'll start. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Okay, so in theory, we're meant to have finished our webinar, but um, this is such an interesting discussion. I'm inclined to let it keep running for a bit longer. Um, we've got three more questions in the chat box, so I'm going to ask Emily if you can um, answer these questions fairly briefly, and then we will have to draw the conversation to a close. But um, we know we have ways of continuing the conversation after the webinar. Um, so, um, Vicky has a question. Are you there, Vicky? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, my, I've, I've asked two questions which are, are sort of related in terms of how can we reach people um, that's sort of local to my MVP. Um, and I'm trying to think of different ways, but I'm also quite... Um, wary of the fact that when I've tried to reach groups before, we sometimes say we've gone to um, a local temple, for example, or even if I've gone to a local temple with um, somebody from the group who is Sikh themselves, for example, it's still been very difficult to, um, to reach people with young children and, and they don't respond to us. Um, so, for example, there's a church which is only about three minutes walk from my house, which seems to be... Um, a church with lots of African people, um, but I feel quite wary of if I rock up there, um, they really might not like that. And, uh, and it, you know, I don't know, it might make it worse. And I'm just wondering, you know, what feedback have you had in terms of uh, trying to build some trust and, and get some feedback? Um, and also just thinking about what we were saying about qualitative and quantitative um, feedback. Uh, are you able to reach people online with uh, written surveys, or is that something that's very that people don't tend to respond to? Perhaps they don't have the, um, the technology, or they don't like to write, or I don't know. I'm just wondering about different approaches. Um, do any of you guys want to respond first? Any of the first questions? So thinking about how um, trying to reach, um, especially DME groups, and, and where, where they're finding that difficult. Have you guys got any ideas before I you? If you guys start. I think um, the way um, the way Emily recruited us, I think that was definitely very useful in the sense that she recruited people that were already linked linked up with these um, marginalised groups. So um, I already, so with the Manor Gardens Welfare Trust, they support um, migrant and refugee women. Um, so that includes their request to public funds, um, those with language barriers, and really, you know, seldom heard women. So I already. Um, 
in a lot of work with them on a you know voluntary basis and also you know on a professional basis. So we already knew them. So it was relatively um, with the maternity mentors because the participants already trusted that particular person. It was relatively easy to just set up the group. And I think in terms of in terms of um, faithful organisations and, and churches and mosques, et cetera, it's it's really helpful if you could just contact probably a religious leader or somebody in the organisation who could then sort of bridge that um, you know, bridge bridge that thing between the between you and the yeah. service users. This is the difficulty that we're having, is we're just not getting a response going that down that avenue and I'm wondering mm -hmm. if it's just the wrong way to do it. So some people have said, Well, if you ask um, a leader at the mosque, it's, if you ask a man, then you'll, they will not go and talk to the women because that's not the way that their culture works. So we have to find a way into the women's group, but we don't know how to so, contact yeah. them. So I would say, essentially, I would put most of your effort into finding that one. You just need, if you get one key person within that group, they will help you to move within that. And if you put all your effort and energy in trying to make that initial contact and build up what you've got to basically create a bridge from at least one person to trust you and trust the MVP and trust the health services. And that won't necessarily be easy. There is already so much mistrust. But it could be, and you're right, I think actually, you know, it depends what the kind of group is and what the setup is. And it might not necessarily be the religious leaders, but there'll be people, there will be informal leaders within those groups. So it might be about trying to, you know, say, right, speaking, getting permission from whoever is, maybe the religious leader of the state, and say, we want to do this. We want to find a key contact within here. Who can help advise on the MVP? We want to find a link. And that, and once you can find that link and, and contact with them and put up some posters in their own languages or in that thing, and say, right, this is what we're looking for, we're recruiting for, especially if, if you are able to um, pay any sort of remuneration for someone to be linked, or if you can at least show people what they're going to get out of it. So saying, you know, you, if we're looking for someone to do this, to hear the voices, to help us to hear voices, and this is going to change services. This is going to mean that the services are specifically for you. You know, making right. sure that it might not be monetary, but making sure that there's some, that they see the value of it. Um, but it's really difficult because so I was a youth worker for many years, and people constantly ask me to speak to young people. And I was a gatekeeper because I was a youth work manager. And I stopped letting people come and speak to our young people because every time they did, they never, ever, ever came back and told us what they did with that information, ever. And I got frustrated by them. The kids got so demoralized that we stopped. So I think it's finding out what are the barriers, not just like, oh, they're not listening, but go and speak to somebody. So who can I speak to? I want to know what do you think of the barriers, not how do I speak to this group of people. How do you think, what are the barriers, what, what are the challenges? And then when you can do that, then you can start to break that down and go, and go through. I think trying to sometimes, if it's not working, just trying to get to a group, then, then that's a good reason. And I would understand what that reason, what those reasons are. So yeah. definitely finding a key person, trying to recruit that person within your MVP so that they feel that they've really got a say. Um, and, and really it's about building relationships and it doesn't happen fast. But when you can build a really strong one, then that will unlock it like massively for you. Okay. All right, Liz. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Liz and Kathy, you're the last two people with questions. Do you have questions that can be dealt with fairly quickly today, or would you like to um, initiate those questions on our Facebook group to keep the conversation going? I'm happy to do it in the Facebook group. Uh, I think Becky had a question as well. I did, yes, that's right. Um, Becky, um, how do you feel? Do you want, is it a quick question we can deal with now, do you think, or would you like to put that on? I don't know, really. I, mean, I think it's, it, it's more around, so we're already sort of in Nottingham using a um, participatory appraisal model. We've recruited volunteers. We've actually got 15 um, sat with us at the moment who go out to difficult to reach groups. They go out to the hospitals, um, you know, various sort of places as well um, to try and get some of this feedback. But actually, it, it's the sustainability of that that we're struggling with. So we have a service level agreement that will take us up till March, um, which has been funded via transformation money, is not recurrent money. Um, and what we're looking at is setting up this sort of model um, to go forward. And it, it, it's it's we do collect um, feedback via sort of other methods as well, but this is a, you know, as, as sort of this presentation shown today, it's a really, really effective model for getting um, feedback from specific groups, and we want to continue it, but um, 
there is like a coordination piece that sort of sits behind it. So we have um, Healthwatch who kind of manage it at the moment. They have an engagement officer who does two days a week work on this and um, coordinating the volunteers, doing all their um, DBS checks, it, all their expenses, all their debriefing, training, all that sort of stuff. So for us to be able to kind of maintain that, we need to have something in place long term. And what we're doing is, is struggling to find the recurrent funds to keep this going. Becky, I'm so glad that you've asked that question at the end of this webinar um, because um, the subject for our next webinar is going to be resourcing your MVP. Um, okay. And I think probably quite a few people on this webinar will be thinking, this sounds fantastic. We would love to take something like this forward locally. How do we resource that? Um, yeah. So I think... So it's fantastic that you've asked that question. It's amazing to hear that you're already doing something like this. But yes, yeah, how do you get something like this to be an ongoing sustainable thing that an MVP can continue to do? So, um, yeah, we would welcome all suggestions about uh, what you would like us to cover um, in that next webinar. Um, I would encourage everyone who's on this webinar, if you're not already, please join our National Maternity Voices Facebook group. If you search on Facebook for National Maternity Voices, You'll find our page, which you can follow, and also a group. If you join that group, that's for service users and staff, um, you will be able to take part in ongoing conversation about what we've been talking about today and also thinking about issues around resourcing the MVP, which we'll be um, also discussing in our next webinar. Um, service users on the call can also join the closed service user Facebook group for MSLC and MVP chairs and service user reps. Um, so I'm going to have to draw the conversation to an end, but thank you so much to everyone who's contributed your thoughts and ideas today. I think it's been a really, really interesting conversation for those of us involved in MVPs to hear about the amazing work that you've all done um, on, on that uh, Best First project in North London um, and to learn from that. And we're definitely going to keep discussing this um, and thinking about how we can apply these methods and how they could relate to those of us working in local MVPs on an ongoing basis. So thank you so much to Emily and Igil and Abbott. Thank you to Lisa for all your technical support and to Liz for your help with um, monitoring the chat. And thank you to everyone who's attended today. And I look forward to continue, continuing the conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>